so uh, my name is uh, Sonne Willems and I'm, uh, if you start this master, I will be your teacher for the course Multivariate Analysis and Multidimensional Data Analysis. And um, today I'll give you an example lecture from this course. It will be quite dense. <laughs> Usually I have more time than half an hour to explain the concept, so I'll just stick to the uh, general uh, idea of the model that I will discuss uh, to give you a first insight of what you might learn in this course. Um, so the topic that I'm going to discuss today is optimal scaling transformations in linear models. It's also called Katreg from categorical regression. And I'll explain a little bit to you what this means. Um, so uh, I will first I'll tell you a little bit about the course, so the main uh, topics that we will discuss. And then I will go into the topic of optimal scaling um, uh, for the lecture today. And also show you examples in SPSS and in R. Um, so about this course, we have... Oh. Oh, okay, there seems to be an issue with the screen share, but I think it's back again. Um, so the main topics of this course are, uh, are twofold. Um, we look at the multivariate analysis of dependence. So that means that we are looking at relationships between variables in different sets. And then each of the sets have different rules. So for example, a very common one that we'll discuss in many details is uh, a data set where we have an outcome Y and a data uh, set with variables or predictor variables X, where we try to predict variable Y from the set of predictors X. So uh, we are looking at the relationship between Y and the set of predictors X, and the two sets have a different rule. One is the, uh, the, uh, one is the predictor and the other is the outcome. Uh, that's one of the topics, and we'll discuss several models on that. And I'll, today I will discuss one of the models. Um, another big topic in this course is the multivariate analysis of interdependence. So, um, oh, <laughs> just like today, I see you are a bit slower. Okay. Um, so instead of uh, looking at interdependence between two sets, we actually look at the relationship between variables within one set. So in this case, we only have one set of data. So for example, only a data set X, and we look at the roles, uh, uh, the roles between those variables. So for example, the inter uh, interrelations. And um, then each variable has the same role. And we just want to know, for example, uh, our all these questions measuring the same construct or maybe different constructs and how are they related to each other. Um, another topic that we will discuss a lot is what to do with nonlinear data. So um, uh, with the, the course, the, the models that we mainly discuss uh, all originate from a psychological uh, research of psychological data, which have a lot of Likert scales, like you might recognize them. If you ever fill in a survey, you usually get a question uh, whether, uh, and you can indicate whether you uh, completely disagree or completely agree with the statement. And um, then you fill in one of the five or seven categories. So that gives you categorical data, which is usually not, uh, yeah, which is not continuous and usually also not linear. So in this course, we'll also focus on what to do with nonlinear data. And that's also the topic that I will discuss today. So um, there are many different data types. And um, uh, the first one is the nominal categorical uh, data which means that uh, we have categories and they, uh, they indicate separate groups. So for example, uh, a group of people who do not smoke and a group of people who do smoke. Um, and there's no ordering in these groups. So either you smoke or you don't, but there's not uh, an ordering. Uh, the second category, uh, or yeah, and the, in normal models, these are included in, uh, in a model using dummy coding. You may recognize this from a linear models class if you, uh, if you have a, a two uh, course like that, then it's included as dummy coding and each category is sort of analyzed separately. Uh, there's a second type of categorical uh, variable, which is uh, the ordinal categorical data. And these uh, are also categories. So for example, uh, uh, a pain skill or a Likert skill that I just discussed. So in this case, we, uh, you either have no pain at all, maybe a little pain or very much pain. So, and you indicate one of these, these smileys. Um, so you indicate one 
uh, smiley, so that means that you are in that group. But there's also an ordering among these groups. So um, this green one is less pain than the second, and this one is again less pain than the third. And same with Likert scales from uh, you very much don't agree to you very much agree. There's always some ordering in that. And currently there are two ways to, or usually there are two ways to analyze this data, either with dummy coding, like we saw before with the smoking example. <clears throat> And then we treat all the um, all the categories separately. So we analyze, uh, we um, find uh, model parameters for each of the categories separately. Or if you want, but the, the downside of this is that you may lose the ordering. So um, it could be that your estimate for the first category is higher than for the second, and then again way higher for the third. So you don't see the ordering uh, of the original categories back in your analysis. Um, sometimes people want to force this ordering. So a usual thing that is done is that um, the, uh, the categories are given values, so integer values. So for example, uh, the green smiley is given the value one, the yellow one is given the uh, value two, and the red one is given the value uh, three. And then it's included as a, uh, as a continuous variable in the data set. So it's just treated uh, numerically. Uh, the downside of this, like the advantage is that you keep the ordering, but the downside is that you also have uh, in include uh, equal distances. Since this is one, two, three, it means that the distances between green and yellow and yellow and uh, red are equal. That's sort of what you enforce by giving them integer values. And then the third data type is numeric data. So an example would be age. And then it's just yeah, a numerical value. And when you go from uh, uh, your first year to your second, that's exactly one year. And it's the same as going from 23 to 24, for example. So we have equal relative spacing between, uh, the, between the groups and between the values. So these are three different, oh yeah, and usually these are included as a continuous variable in the data set. And we also keep this um, equal relative spacing, or like it's, it says, like if you go up one category, then uh, your prediction goes up a certain amount. So it's, it's a linear effect that we usually model. Um, but the problem is like, what if you want to do something else? So for example, if you have the categorical data, but it's, it has an ordering, it's ordinal, and you want to keep this ordering, but you do not want to enforce this straight line. You don't want to enforce the equal spacing. Uh, so for example, you want the first two, if they are um, originally, uh, the first one is a little bit higher than the second maybe, what if you want to force them to be uh, non, uh, yeah, to be monotone? Then um, you want some to find something like this, that it's first flat and then goes up. So at least the first one is not above the second one because that would sort of screw up your ordering. And in continuous data, um, what if you don't want uh, a straight line, but you want to include some uh, transformation like this or uh, like this U shape? So, for example, if you're looking at um, the number of car accidents that someone um, causes, then probably when you're very young and just got your driver license, you have a higher probability of making uh, or causing accidents than when you are an experienced driver. And once you get older and maybe you don't see as well as you used to, you may cause more accidents again. So then you get this uh, U-shape that you might want to include in your model. So this is what um, the optimal scaling um, uh, transformations focus on, the optimal scaling um, uh, uh, method. So what we do with optimal scaling is that we transform the variables first. So in the um, in the model, so uh, instead of using our original variables x, we transform them with some function and we include those transformations in the model. And then the transformations can have many different shapes. So um, uh, we usually in this optimal scaling setting, we have uh, five. It's a nominal and the ordinal scaling. So you will recognize the names from the data uh, types that I just described. So with the nominal one, you don't imply any ordering. You just have one estimate for each of the groups or for each of the categories. For ordinal, you enforce an ordering, and you can also um, have a, a non-monotone spline or a monotone spline. And that's usually when you have a lot of categories, you want, or, or if you have categorical or continuous data, you may want to have like a more smooth uh, transformation uh, 
than when you have only a few categories. And also to make things complete, you can also choose the numeric scaling level, which is just uh, the standard for a linear model. So that's the optimal scaling approach. So how do we do this? Um, so I'm not sure if you all took a linear models course. I hope you did. And if not, don't worry too much. You'll get the course before you start the Babda course. Uh, but in your linear model course, you have probably learned about ordinary linear regression. And um, in this linear regression, the, there, you're trying to predict an outcome. Why? Based on a linear predictor. So it's a sort of a weighted sum of your original predictor variables, which are called x. So uh, the model is uh, the sum of betas times your x's and the j's uh, are start at one and sum up to p. Those are the number of variables that are in your model. And then if you want to fit this ordinary, at least, uh, ordinary linear regression model, we minimize, minimize the loss function. So we try to minimize the distance between the actual outcome and the predicted outcome. So the actual outcome, we have it, it's y. It's in our data set, and we uh, try to minimize the distance between that known outcome and the predicted outcome, which is x times beta. And this, uh, if you do some mathematics, this is a uh, there's a very simple solution to it. Like there's, it's a closed form solution, so we know the exact answer. We can calculate it directly with one formula, which is this one. So that's all nice and clean. It's very sort of easy to do. It's a very basic model. Um, but then we want to include optimal scaling uh, to this regression model. And in that case, we do, our linear predictor changes a little bit because we still have our betas, our model parameters, but now our uh, variables are transformed. So we have this transformation in our, uh, in our linear predictor. It's still sort of a linear predictor because it's linear in, in the parameters, but there may be some nonlinearity in the transformations. And remember that transformations could be either uh, any of the five uh, options that I mentioned before, like nominal, ordinal, uh, one of the two splines, or numeric. And even on top scaling, we can also decide to transform the outcome. So also have uh, a transformation of the outcome. And then if we include this all together in one model, <clears throat> we have a new loss function. So the original, originally we saw the, uh, the, um, the actual um, values of the outcome y were here and then minus the uh, linear predictor. But now we have transformed the outcome y and also transformed the predictor variables. So our uh, uh, loss function changed a little bit. And in this case, we, we have several unknowns. Uh, so in the uh, linear regression model, we were only interested in, um, in estimating the betas, which are the model parameters, because we knew the data and we knew the, uh, we knew the predictor variables and we knew the outcome variable. Um, we had just have their values. But in this case, we want to estimate the model parameters, so the betas, plus all the quantifications, so plus all the transformations, because we're going to estimate them from the data. So with this loss function, it's, it's slightly more complicated to, uh, to find the minimum because we have more unknowns. There's no closed form solution like I showed you before, but we need an iterative algorithm to fit this model. And um, the iterative algorithm looks a little bit like this. So uh, like with any algorithm, you have to initialize it first, so you have to choose some starting values for your parameters. So for the model parameters, beta plus your uh, quantifications. And then the next steps are split. So we run this, um, uh, this um, uh, algorithm, uh, one variable at a time. And for each variable, we first fit the optimal scaling part, so the quantifications. And when we finish those, we, we put them, uh, we, we fix them. And then for those uh, quantifications, we find the best uh, uh, model fit, so the, the, the fitting parameter beta. And then we do this for each of the variables uh, separately. And then once we have uh, done this for each variable in the model, we check whether the algorithm converged. So did we, are we still um, improving the fit or not, or is it stabilized? If not, we do another round. So we, again, for each variable at a time, we fit the quantifications, assuming that the model parameters are fixed, and then um, uh, fit, uh, fix the uh, quantifications that we uh, re-estimated and then find the, uh, the new betas that go with that. And then we do this iteratively and each time 
uh, check if the algorithm converged. And if it converged, we stop the, uh, we stop the um, algorithm and we have our final model. So instead of having like one formula that gives us the model parameters beta, we have to do like this iterative algorithm to find, um, uh, to find our, our model. So the optimal scaling part is, um, uh, in that case, we, uh, we first fit unrestricted solutions. So we just fit whatever is best for each of the separate groups, like treat them as individual uh, categories that have nothing to do with each other. And once we have this unrestricted solution, we apply restrictions according to our chosen scaling level. So if we do, if we choose a nominal scaling level, we actually, we don't apply any restriction because we treat them uh, as separate categories. But if we want to include, or if we want to force a spline transformation, then we uh, fit the spline transformation on the unrestricted solution. And in the model estimation part, that is actually uh, the same as with a linear regression model, you can update your betas using the original formula uh, from the linear regression model. So this is an iterative algorithm and it will take some time to, uh, to converge, but it will give you the uh, regression model with optimal scaling quantifications. So in this course, we, we aim that you understand the theory at the end and that you're able to interpret the model results, but also to implement the algorithm. So you will do some programming to actually program this algorithm in, in R. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's a combination of uh, understanding theory, interpreting models, but also um, being able to actually program these algorithms yourself. So I want to show you a small example from SPSS. <clears throat> and this is about a data set which, um, in which we have data from patients. And for each of the patients, the doctors have to make a decision on whether they get day clinic treatment. So that means that the, the patient comes to the hospital like every day to get the treatment, but sleeps at home. Or the other option is inpatient treatment, which means that um, the patient will sleep at the hospital or at the clinic and then get treatment uh, like day in, day out, and just stay there. And this decision is, of course, based on several uh, different aspects. And we can try to fit a model to predict which um, decision will be made for each, per, uh, each patient. And I'll show you how we can um, find the optimal scaling level for uh, variables that are predictors in this model. Um, oh, so I'll have to go to SPSS. So I have this data set. Uh, yeah, you can still see it. Um, so the treatment choice, that's the indicator of, uh, of what choice is actually made for the patient. And uh, a value of one means that a patient gets a day clinic treatment and a value of two means that you have an, you get an inpatient treatment. And then there are um, five uh, predictor variables, like it's uh, travel time, transportation, transformation, oh, sorry, transportation impaired due to psychological issues. You could have a need for medical care. You could have a need to apply the therapy in everyday life and a need uh, to be relieved of family conflicts. So what we can do first is have a look at the data itself. So we can ask SPSS to give, a, give us the frequencies of the um, of each of the variables and then ask it to make oh, there, to make uh, bar charts for us. So we have some visualization of what our data looks like. And I get a second screen it's there. So here is the output of that. So um, the treatment choice is given here. So we see that slightly more patients in the end get the day clinic uh, treatment uh, compared to the inpatient uh, treatment, but it's quite quite balanced actually. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, then the travel time. Um, these values are, I think it's like quarter of an hour. So this is like a one, a zero to 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, etc. So most people have very little travel time, but there are a few people who have like quite long travel times. So you may include that in your decision. If a patient has to travel uh, back and forth a long way, then maybe giving their uh, bed at the hospital is uh, beneficial for them. Um, and this variable indicates uh, whether, whether patients are uh, have uh, transportation impairedness due to psychological issues. And um, a low value means that they have not so many problems and a higher value means that they have quite some problems with that. So in our data set, most of the people have only 
uh, like none problems or some problems with that. Um, then there's the question, do patients need medical care? That's this variable need for medical care. And then we see that most need some medical care and only few need a lot of medical care. Then there's also the question like, do you need to apply your therapy in everyday life? So do you need practice in your everyday life? And it turns out that many people actually do need to imply, uh, apply the therapy in everyday life. So this could be a reason why you want the patient to stay at home so they can actually apply the therapy right away when they're at home. And then there's a question like, do you need to be relieved from your family conflicts? Uh, most people don't, but quite a few do have to be relieved. So that could also be a reason, like take them out of this conflict, give them uh, a bed at the hospital so they can sort of uh, yeah, be out of the problems. Um, so this gives them some insight in our, in our data set first. Uh, which is always good. So what we notice from a data side uh, point of view is that these all these variables um, have four categories. So these have all have four categories, except for travel time. It has uh, slightly more categories, uh, namely eight. So that's what we need to know if we make a decision on how to treat this data. So um, this is uh, these are categorical. Um, uh, categorical variables, but they do have an ordering. Like a small number means that there is very little problems, and a large number, so number four, means that there are many problems with, uh, for, for example, the transportation. So there is this ordering among the categories. So we may want to uh, include that ordering in our uh, in our model. So what we can do is we can fit um, uh, the regression uh, model using optimal scaling, and then. Uh, I'll just leave the outcome as a numeric scaling level, but for the uh, for the uh, predictive variables, I will start with a nominal scaling level for all of them, just to keep it simple. And then we will ask for transformation plus so that we can see what the transformation looks like and then fit it. So you'll see that uh, SPSS is running a little, takes some time because it's an iterative uh, algorithm, so it needs some time to fit the model. And then we get a lot of uh, output from the uh, from the model. For example, the R square, which is an indicator for how well the model fits the data or how well we can predict uh, the outcome. We have the beta variable, so those are the model parameters that I discussed before. But also we get the transformation plots. So then we see how uh, the, the original values of the, the categories are transformed, and. Um, if I scroll through the transformation plots, we see that most of them actually are, um, are monotone. So they still have this ordering of the original categories um, in, in the transformations. So what we could do is also try, uh, so uh, let me check. So the R square in this case, which is an indicator for how well the model fits, is 0 .4, uh, 0 0.492. But if we change the scaling level from nominal to ordinal, we can see how much this in, uh, influences our model fit. So it used to be 0.492, and now it's slightly less because we put more restrictions on it. So it, it has less, um, uh, yeah, it's more restricted, so it cannot fit as well as before. But the, the difference is very small. It's now 0.489. So it's still a very good fit compared to the others. Our betas will change a little bit. And now you will see that all our transformation plots are monotone because that's what we forced the model to do. So we now have all these monotone uh, functions. And then in some cases, we see that we have a quite a linear fit, um, except for this one. This one has a big step between two and three. Uh, but this one is quite linear, and this one is not very linear. But we could try to see what happens if we do fit uh, do force all of, all of them to be have a numeric scaling level. And then we see that the R square drops a little bit more. So it, it, go, it went from 0.492 to 0.489, I think, and now it dropped to 0.462. Uh, so the fit is quite a bit worse than before. And if we go to transformation plots, we'll see that we are now all have linear transformations because that's what we forced the model to do. So based on this, we have our R square, which means that the higher the R square is, the better the, the model predicts the outcome. 
Um, but there's a trade-off that we have to make because if we enforce more um, uh, restrictions to our data sets, um, so if we go from nominal to ordinal, then actually the interpretation of the transformation is easier because with the ordinal one, since it's a monotone function, we can say if your, uh, if your travel time goes up, you have a higher probability of, um, of getting inpatient treatment. Um, so it's easier to interpret if we have a monotone um, uh, scaling level. So this is a trade-off between uh, do we want a higher R square or do we want an easier model that is easier to interpret. And in this case, since this is a very small difference between the R squares, I would say that, um, uh, that I would go for the ordinal one because then you still have a high R square. Uh, but it's slightly easier to uh, interpret. Well, if we go to, for the numeric scaling level, then the R squared drops a little bit more. So that's maybe a waste of prediction um, value. Um, and then in the course, we'll look at many other things, but I don't have time for that. Uh, so we will look at prediction for new data. So how well does the model do for new data? Do we maybe overfit on the training set or do we do well in uh, a test set? And we also look at regularization, which can, for example, be used for uh, variable selection. So which variables are useful in the model and which one could we also leave out? I wanted to show you an R example. I will quickly go to it just to show you. So one of the assignments that the students are actually working on at this moment um, is to, to make this, uh, to uh, program this um, algorithm yourself. So for example, I will give you an, uh, a template with some code in it, but then uh, you as a student will include some of the gaps. So here I left some gaps for students to fill in. So um, a lot of it is given, but the crucial steps in the, in, in the uh, R code are, are to be filled in by you. So you really learn how to implement this algorithm in R and how to like write your own optimal scaling algorithm, which is, I think, quite cool. So for example, you will see in the code that, um, uh, that we run, uh, where is it? That we run the algorithm we continue it well uh, as long as it's not converged. And then for each time we up, we go through all the separate uh, variables and then uh, from variable one up until P and then uh, update the quantifications. So here, update quantifications and also update the coefficients uh, in, each, uh, in each step for each variable separately. And after that, we always check whether the uh, algorithm converged or not. And then you will fill it in as a student, uh, fill in all the gaps, and then you write your own algorithm. So that's that's quite cool, I would say. Um, yeah, so that's uh, in a very, <laughs> very short time, an introduction to optimal scaling regression and on how uh, yeah, what you would learn in, uh, in this course. So um, I just wanted to note that uh, we focus on theory, but also how to apply it. So how to do it in R, and uh, we also use FSS, and you will focus on how to interpret results, how, what, what changes if you choose different settings. And this topic of optimal scaling regression is not the only one. We have a lot of uh, other models that we cover um, during the course, uh, but they're all very, very interesting, I would say. Thank you.